Oh, no, I don't want you videoing anything. Oh, my mouth? My own mouth? No. No, okay, no, okay. No, no video. Happy new episode of Depressive Friends. Hope you're having a laughing gas and a good time. Oh, there it is. Oh, yeah. That's a sweet spot right there. Hey, guys. Welcome to Depressive Friends. New episode. Get your teeth done. Talk to you soon. Uh, smash the likes. Subscribe. Depressive Friends. All right. See ya. How you doing? Doing great, doing great. You're my first podcast in Oregon. Hey. So, this is the 109th episode of Brett's with Friends with my good old friend, builder, uh, uh, man, jack of all trades, uh, sculptor, uh, husband, um, philanthropist. Uh, is there anything else I'm missing? Um, just general wizardry. Oh, perfect. I, I should have just said that. Yeah. So wait, we were just talking. We're going to do a quick uh, episode. So thanks for doing this. It'll be fun. We'll be getting some good information. I want to really quick. Um, you're in the area of the, and we were talking, discussing um, the weather that's about to hit LA. Well, I know we, I, I, about, uh, we can cover a little bit of it just real quick because it's just about to happen. We're recording this right now on a Friday at five o'clock. Six, yeah, five o'clock. So it's about to hit. You don't know when it's going to hit. And um, you're telling me some words of wisdom about like, you know, the how it's uh, going to be affected if, if it's, you know, the danger zones with the homeless and stuff like that. Do you want to just talk a little bit about it? Because people, yeah, sure. I'm sure people are actually preparing for it right now and not really uh, into watching a tube or, you know, a show about it, but it's current information that's might be, yeah. it might be really historical. Well, we'll see. It hasn't happened since I think 1937, but I was in New York for, uh, what was that? Hurricane Floyd. When was that? Late 90s. And there was so much hype about it. I, I walked down into uh, NoHo and hung out in a bar. <laughs> it was in uh They made a big deal out of it. It flooded the subways. and But, uh, you know, news is mostly drama and, you know, steering the herd, usually not in a good direction. So. I'll, I'll just listen to the uh, the National Weather Station out of Oxnard. It's, uh, um, or what do you call it? All the guys that are uh, yachties and fishermen and stuff, they have a weather cube. And they just get current, up-to-date stuff and see uh, a much more accurate and concise uh, info than watching uh, regular TV news and weather. What's that website called it? Well, they call it a wet a weather cube, but uh, anybody that's uh, uh, that's that goes out on the water frequently knows what that is and has one. But okay. um, yeah, so I don't know. I haven't really planned or prepped. I usually uh, will fill up uh, a couple of three gallon containers from my RO under the sink, and you know just make sure that I got a fresh supply of water if I need it. And uh, tell it like gas is your gas tank filled? Uh, my vehicles, yeah. Um, don't really plan on going anywhere in in all that. <laughs> does your it, does a car turn into a boat? That would be, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Oh, let's go and get stuck in traffic. That'll be fun. Uh, no, we had a supply of uh, at least 30, 30 to sixty days of basic starchy stuff and you know a camp stove with plenty of propane cartridges just assuming worst case scenario there's no power and the gas is shut off and oops the water shut off i guess the pumps aren't working you know i've, I've got wash water i've got a a 50 gallon barrel of uh, water to clean plates and bodies hey are people are people allowed to uh do the runoff there can they can they uh harness the water that's water that's fallen and 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 use it or is it because that's i don't know if that's legal in oregon to it's county to county i know that in some states and some counties you can't harvest the rainwater it's like no you can't capture it and use it in any way it, it belongs to uh the government or something i think utah and i don't know what other states why is like. that why is that you think what what's the deal with that um, 
oh, just typical political machine nonsense, you know. Oh, <laughs> I'm rules so we can give somebody a job to go enforce them. Let, no, let, let's let's pay ourselves to spend a couple of years planning things, and then we'll write some laws, and it won't make any sense, and it won't really make any effective difference. But that's what we do for a living. We're we're uh, policymakers. No, I mean that's. <laughs> off topic a little bit but i helped uh with the the green industry council back when i was an arborist we wanted to have a tree trimming or a tree protection and landscaping ordinance written into um into some of the city recs for the city of los angeles and wow best intentions and everything what a giant waste of time um it's really hard to give constructive input with somebody that never really did any kind of practical work for a living, like go negotiate with somebody to go do a thing. And, you know, I've always done trades, mm -hmm. you know, something, trim a tree, whatever. But uh, I don't know when people just have their heads in books and they just write laws that there's a lack of a practical, let's just get the shit done approach to things. They, they like to plan and write things down and I just do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you're moving around that many people though, if you're, you know, a public servant like that, I mean, it's gotta be pretty intense work anyways. I mean, I know that it's probably, it's probably a world that is probably so beyond what, like we, what we like to do, like your hands on apparently making it happen right now. Can you tell oh, yeah. me kind of what that is? Sure. Yeah, this is early. A, I'm making a, an outdoor dining table. This is eBay. Uh, very dense, very heavy stuff. It's beautiful hardwood, and uh, you have to pre-drill everything because uh, its weakness is it'll f fracture longitudinally if you don't pre-drill. You can't just get an impact wrench and crank away on it. But uh, it's very expensive material, but it's going to be gorgeous. Um, that's a that's a table. Yeah, this is going to be a, a, a an outdoor dining table. How uh, long is that? Because it looks huge. Is it more than eight foot? Ten feet. Yeah, it's going to be massively heavy. The lumber is so dense. It's uh, oh gosh, we're probably looking at two fifty, two seventy five. By the time I got the legs on, the four by four legs are pretty heavy. Oh, that's not bad. It'll be solid. That's what you want, right? Yeah, I've got this same setup here. I've got about 60 linear feet of this at the quad at UCLA, or no, USC, at the new quad there at uh, in front of the Sun Life. It's a juice and smoothie place. Hmm. But about 60 linear feet of this Ipe, uh outdoor dining tables uh, with benches. Where's that and, wood come from? Uh, Brazil. So it's shipped all the way from Brazil. So you yeah. are you, are you, is that part of the rainforest you have in there, in your yard there? I don't know. It's 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 supposedly sustainably grown. Um, <laughs> the old, old growth stuff is really oily and dense and lasts a long time. But you know what I like? What I got in my hand right here. This is uh, well, they used to call it paper stone. Uh, it's called rich light, and they're up out of Seattle. But what this is is wood pulp and alphatic resin to make skate ramps out of it. And it's food grade, does not off gas. Uh, you can't hurt it. It's very durable. And you get a scratch in it, you can buff it out. And it looks more like stone than wood. Yeah, it's going to look like a piece of slate there. Yeah, it's a gorgeous material. I've done a lot with it. but And it's not cheap. It's like 500 bucks for a 4 by 8 sheet and 3 quarters thick. You better use every set. You, you use every bit of that shit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they make fretboards and stuff out of it. It's it's a really nice material. But I try What are you going to gonna use it on? What are you going to use it for? Oh, I've used it on a bunch of stuff. It makes good uh, cabinet liners, like in a kitchen where you've got water screwing up MDF and growing mold and stuff. You make your base cabinet floors out of this stuff. You, I replace base cabinet floors that have rotted out with this stuff because it never rots out. Could you use uh, like a kitchen counter or stuff like a linoleum finish or like a like a sink? Uh, you can make sinks out of this. I've seen glue ups. 
look at just Google Rich Light, and then you'll see all kinds of pics and videos. I've had I've seen this stuff stacked up like five inches thick, and it was machined. No, thicker than that. Damn, it was like a foot thick, and they machined it into a basin for a lab for a sink. Wow. And it, or, yeah, and you can machine all kinds of details in it. It holds a really crisp edge. Yeah, you probably do some laser work on it. Yeah, in fact, if you bevel it, it the edge is dangerously sharp. I cut my one of my vacuum hoses. Yeah, it looks like uh, a sling blade. It looks like a what, fucking uh, I don't know, uh, yeah, other guy with that with a lawnmower thing. You Look, can your little sling blade there. I mean, shit, they oh, dudes have made prison shanks out of paper if you compact it well enough. It, it, <laughs> You're giving people ideas, man. <laughs> Hopefully, I, I saw it on TV on a, a after school special or something. <laughs> the more you know, the more you know. Well, here's my messy outdoor shop. This is where I do all the woodwork mayhem. Uh, let's let's do a little tour. Um, let's see. Used to have a garden going, but I hate when rats eat the tomato the day before you're going to pick it. And we got a lot of squirrels. So this is uh, pretty messy. It looks like the quarters episode. I want to show you some of my art. This is uh, just some dead wood I took out of an oak back in my arborist days, and I made a little dude out of it. And uh, Nope. Random cow horn I stuck in the in the holler. Nice. Uh, that, about forty years. Well, that was carved on a Fred Siegel property off Canaan when I first moved out here. So that's like uh, eighty-seven. I think I did that. Some random junk, a boat anchor, and those nail head looking things. Those are for uh, what's called soil nailing. It's for stabilizing uh, a slope that you're trying to build a road or a home on. And what they do is they uh, pound this uh, Schedule 80 steel pipe with this nail head on it uh, hydraulically with a, with a big giant uh, jackhammer set up on a, a backhoe. And you basically just beat them into the dirt like nails. And when you hit something solid, you stop. And that holds up three-way berms and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. So you have that piece that I did that piece of wood one the the that I pulled apart two pieces of wood and it made like a landscape. Oh yeah, where do I have that? It's, it was on the outs. It was in the garden area or something like that. Yeah, near that. I'm the, so I'm gonna feed my fish. Check these dudes out. Get a fish, koi. You don't have any koi. You have koi. I got some really pretty big uh, fantails in here. Hey, wait, listen. You have koi and they don't get eaten by the uh, by the mm -hmm. things living in the mountains. No, uh, the raccoons won't mess with them. They haven't found them, and there's lots of raccoons in the neighborhood. Really? I yeah. I, I know a couple that live in Venice, and they started a koi pond, and they came out one day, and there's like a raccoon just having its time and just eating like a banana. Yeah. Um, well, they haven't found them yet. There was a coyote one morning sitting right there looking at the pond, but uh, most critters will not jump in because they realize it'd be hard to get out. Really? Far so good. Well, knock on wood, I, the safety of those delicious, delicious food fish. No, just got. I love koi. Yeah. They're really pretty. To, I like uh, painting them occasionally. They're fun. Yeah, to them got a, a little pond out front where they're starting to get pretty big, but these guys are getting pretty chubby. Yeah, these like those are not small. No. Well, this is a Costco pool that I don't think costs more than about three hundred bucks. Uh -oh. Really nice Owasi brand. What did I drop on that? About eleven hundred bucks, something like that. We losing a signal for a second. You're back. Well, that's the filter. It's got a UV lamp in it, and that really helps control all the ammonia and the algae. But uh, you got to stay on top of this. You got to put enzymes in it. Um, a living, living, breathing organism, micro. Uh, my yeah, problem. and I got to uh, dechlorinate the water as I refill it. You know, a lot of evaporation happens, so. Well, they uh, seem like they're pretty healthy, happy fish. Yeah, they they are doing well. They can live for like a long time, right, Koi? Oh, yeah, they'll get huge. They'll live for decades and get quite large. 
Um, I was going to show you some of my stones up here, but uh, I, don't, I hope we don't lose a signal. But I've got these. Uh, these are legit for pulling uh, telluric currents up out of the ground. Uh, copper pipe with the quartz crystals on the top. And I've got some really nice pieces in here. Is that your we still got a signal? Yeah, we still got a signal. Is that like your wizard? Uh, is that your uh, Gandalf like staff? Uh oh, we're losing contact. We're losing contact. Oh shit. If we lose contact, let's reconnect. Do my uh, meditation and I bounce on this uh, little rebounder thing and chant and do my mantras and stuff in front Are of this disc. Um, is, no, um, I don't have a specific routine. Or, <laughs> no, I add that know, I'll, I'll my tongue. Things. I was like, what am I about to say? These words are already coming out. I just didn't know about like if you had a mantra of <laughs> you, you made up or somebody gave you or something. Oh like yeah, that. totally. Well, I use mala, I use mala beads because it's a hundred and eight, and there's a whole math principle and there's a reason for the hundred and eight. Um, but yeah, it's a, a great way to just keep track and come out here and meditate first thing before I turn on any electronic device. I'm out here for. My whole morning, it takes me a good 40 minutes before I turn on any electronic stuff. And, you know, I'm still ready to go at quarter to seven, usually. Yeah, it's good to regulate. I'm trying to do that better. Anyways, out here. Yeah, so these are some lovely pieces I got in here. And the whole thing is about balancing polarity. I've got these dark, smoky quartz over here. Got all night behind it. And then this quartz, some citrine. But inside the walls, I have layered steel wool um, fabric as well as uh, uh, wood panels. And if you know what that is, it's uh, uh, ill. You, you know what a rife machine is? Uh, uh, it's, uh, what, what do you call it? Orgone generator. Uh, Wilhelm Reich would build these little booths and I just figured, let's just line the walls with that and see if it's any, uh, what yep. the gravity thing that uh, was, was trying to get at was what occurs in pyramids. And, you know, he, he called it uh, gravitational waves and has all kinds of interesting theory behind it. If you look up uh, Kozarev, C-K-O-Z-A-R-E-V. Um, all kinds of white papers that he had published, and it's it's legit. So, it, what is I that? Is, really that wood? is it like a wood? Then is it a wood or is it a fabric or like it's a combination of things? Relating the whole thing, but wh what it is is sheet metal, steel wool fabric, and then a, a quarter inch wood panel, and then you layer the metallic and then non metallic material. And by alternating that, it could generate this uh, orgone energy, as it were. Oh, and, nice. Uh, Have you ever been to the Integratron? Uh, it's, uh, I, not in a very long time. Back in the 70s, uh, a buddy of mine, his dad had a little cabin out there. And we'd go out there and party and do stupid shit, riding dirt bikes and shooting guns. And, yeah, but, it's uh, funny. Yeah, there. interesting place out there. The Integratron was beautiful. I have a video yeah. that I've been trying. I shot like uh, we're all tripping on mushrooms over there, and uh, I shot uh, like a video, and I still can't get it back from the guy after yeah. five years of begging. It's... But it's like gold. But like uh, that place is very, very like uh, it's like being inside of a drum. Oh yeah, the acoustics are wild. Really love this green here. I kind of ran out of room, so I got this one planted in the ground for now. But I'm going to put it on a mount. And then I've got another really cool smoky quartz. But to me, from this angle, looks like a sea turtle. You see that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, like uh, a... that comes uh, off of the mountains. So this here, it's got a lot of... Uh, opaqueness to it yeah and we sometimes guys will buff this out and try to to get it a little more clear 
and they can get more money out of the stone when you do that. But I, I sometimes like to just leave them alone. Um, yeah. Some of these in here, like this one was polished and it's absolutely stunning. It's uh, about 280 pounds, something like that. And uh, I'm going to redo the base that it's on, but this thing's just to give you a sense of scale. <laughs> wow, shit! It's it's this one's really special. Wow! And that's one thing you job you you did the mounting of that and that made that. So what kind yeah. of steel did you use? Did you use just wrought iron? Or this is it... just regular mild steel, regular carbon steel. This is one I'm going to redo it. It's a little dangerous, kind of wild. Well, I can't see it. Point more towards the thing that you're talking about. There you go. Here we go. But this one was not polished. It has a little more opaque because it's a little more like a like a frosted sort of texture on it. Mm -hmm. It's the way it comes out of the ground. This one's got some nice tourmaline points coming out of it. The smoky one here. Mm. But I really enjoy working with these things. These mineral beings. Yes, yeah, so really are those are part of your collection, or are you uh, are those the clients, or what are you doing with those things? What are they looking? Yep. At? You're hogging them all for yourself, huh? Let's see. Well, <laughs> I'm with them. I'm very lucky. They belong to a client, and uh, I make mounts for them. And as he wants some of the pieces, uh, one of them just went to a new store location in Chicago, so um, sent one off to a new home just last week. Nice. But, uh, yeah, he was going to open a, a like a gallery space somewhere and just hasn't gotten around to it. So I get to hang out with him in the meantime. He can. Yeah, it's a win win. Get a yeah, totally. it's a lot of nice work. Of it. So, you know, it's some it's sometimes it's it's good that you get to spend time with it sometimes because sometimes when a painting sometimes goes and you're like, oh, wait, it's oh, you kind of like, oh, I wish I'd spent more time with it. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's also fun is you re-encounter pieces that you completely forgot you made and somebody shows it to you and it's like, wait, oh, wow. Yeah. Now I remember that one. <laughs> yeah. That's a trip. It's good. It's I good. wish it, yeah. The volume work. I would, you know, do some more. Um, I, I like this thing. Yeah, I, I wear this. I think about you every day because I still have this, um, this right here on my camera. Oh, sweet. Yeah, you so got one my of my key. That's my keychain. Yeah. I would see that every day. Yeah, I remember when you, we did like a that was the very thing. first piece I ever did. That was in '94, and like the back of it too. Like you put your uh, your thing on the back. Mm -hmm. Your stamp, the Artitude logo. Yeah, yeah, this, thing, this thing's sweet. Like, like, I, because I'm not into jewelry. When you, I, I forget how if you gave it to me or we did like a trade a bit or something like that. But um, I remember the trade, and um, I was like not used. I don't really wear jewelry or necklaces or anything on, you know. My and they, I said, "What? Well, what did I do with it? You know, put it in your pocket. Have it flipped outside of the pocket. You know where your keys are at." I was like, "Yeah, that's perfect." <laughs> and so that's exactly yeah. what I've been doing. And I, if I lose, I will never lose this thing. Right on. If it's gone yeah, for I a second, I I know about it. I generally don't wear any while I'm working because I'm always. You don't want to get a finger yanked off or anything, get something caught in a machine. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, um, I would like to get into, do you want to talk a little bit about, um, oh gosh, I don't want to get started too much, but, I, and also, uh, you have a, a, uh, let's jump into the future a little bit. Okay. Let's bypass the now. Because we all know what's happening now, and that we could dissect it. And but, how does this look like in maybe two or three years from now? Well, are we seeing like um, I have my perspective, but I mean, like, uh, do you see a pattern at all happening? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. I'll tell you. Um, History is amazing, and uh, so is holotropic breathing, because uh, they, they called it rebirthing. Um, Ingo Swan and some other guys, when they uh, 
started doing this, found out that, wow, you can have really amazing, enlightening experiences without drugs. You just breathe in a particular manner for a period of time and induce those states. But, uh, you know, like uh, a few teachers have said, I mean, the truth is within and everything you actually need, you already have. Yeah. Is quantum entanglement. And so we got tricked, if you will, deceived, just conditioned to look outside ourselves for all of the answers to all things. And we never were taught that there's an inner guidance system that we all have. And some of us have very particular gifts. And it's a wonderful realm, uh, all of that. But all that is discouraged. And so we look outside ourselves for all things. And um, gosh, you know, it it's, doesn't take long to go into a really blissful state when I just sort of collapse inward. Um, it's kind of like a, a porous field. Uh, it's like a donut with a rotating energy field that collapses in on itself. And yeah. It's what a black hole is. It's a lot of what runs our little snow globe here, similar energetic principles. So, you know, uh, you look at the, the field going out expanding out looking outside that's one direction but the other would be pulling in sort of like what a black hole does i don't know these visuals are really helpful because it helps me just trust and sort of guide my energy to explore a certain way but dang you know it, it's <laughs> i used to follow a lot of teachers and uh this is basically a closed system here it all keeps looping back on itself and soul trap whatever, whatever you want to call this whatever your perception is what all this is and what it's for i mean personally i think uh, if you have a mind wipe every time it's not a school mm -hmm. yeah if you can't oh. remember if there's a multiple multiple lives and you remember or scenarios yeah. that, i think that scenario when things sort of repeat and you get the deja vu you're all, well, I sort of feel like I've been done this before. Or, you know, that that little magic moment. You like you know, you can always feel it happening before it happens as well. But because yeah. you're like you're kind of like it's and then what happens, it happens really quick. But sometimes, but depends on what you call quick. But um Yeah. Yeah, it's trip. It like like um I remember back when I was doing a lot of ecstasy and a lot of a lot of uh mushrooms and stuff like that or more is like when the ecstasy came over pretty heavy experiences and stuff like that but like um there is a very like uh you know everybody thought they're a multi-dimensional time and space traveler you know and i i have never yeah, heard a master tone and dump will do that, <laughs> was that? well but also like people started getting it, it takes out it puts people in different scenarios too because like some people use it as a means to have something over top of a people and they're sort of like using it like i'm the the, the basically the chosen one to that only i'm here to distribute this information uh but so there's a weird interesting thing that it does to some people or i don't know but like but i still believe in mo some of the concepts that were completely psychedelic that i were deja vu in themselves but um i think we live in a material reality where how things are, you know, the vision in your mind or the echoes of, of, of things that really resonate with you, uh, over time they sort of get washed away. But you still remember them. I mean, I didn't forget them, and I still yeah. feel like a part of that. Like I'm here to do important things. But like the the way some people process that information, I guess you can go extreme in one way or another. You know, sure. But like um, since like we live in a material reality and that's great it, like perfectly like you're dealing with a material reality you're working with material reality right now mm -hmm. you no know, like like it grounds you it, you know what you know you know you have your vibe and you like to work and it zens you up you probably get a zen thing from that absolutely uh, yeah. yeah i i it's very therapeutic <laughs> what makes it therapeutic for you uh, this is stuff I would be inclined to do naturally as a kid. I was fortunate to um, 
find certain things extraordinarily cool. Like when I was about four or five, my dad was driving us around Eagle Rock and Pasadena, showing us houses that my great grandfather had built. And I was really impressed. Mm -hmm. I was impressed that that thing's still there now. It looks beautiful. And it looks like it's still going to be there for a very long time. That's that was something significant. I could I could travel over there and it's still going to be there. It's, it's like, is it the the fact that your your art will outlive you? Exactly. Um, there's also another great grandfather that built um, a bunch of stuff in L.A. as well, and also some uh, a small church up in the town of Fillmore up in Ventura. And uh, that church is still there. And that's really cool. So that kind of steered me in a direction of what work feels noble. I always loved building stuff. I was always good at it naturally. Uh, anything mechanical. Um, junior high, I took, well, the wood shop and metal shop had a, con a, a door between the two. And I would have projects going on simultaneously between both shops. And just because I loved doing every bit of it, I was making, oh gosh, so this was fun. I was making little cannons on the lathe. And a buddy of mine had uh, some black powder, and some fuse. So we were making our own little ballistic stuff. And, you know, every seventh grader should do that. That's good learning experience. Making, uh, the, was it out of wood, those the cannons? No, steel. This is a, that was metal oh, shock. Oh, yeah. We, we those left? We were doing aluminum sand castings. No, this was steel. This was. No, but uh, like, well, where those happen? Where those go? Oh, I don't know. I lost track of it. I I oh, blew up some somewhere. Trouble and yeah, it was just a small little thing. Yeah, but, sounds really not like you're trying to blow anything up at all. <laughs> no, no, just, <laughs> it's just seven seventh graders doing what seventh graders do. Or seven, uh, no. I was I was always hanging out where interesting stuff was going on, watching guys wrenching on cars. Um, I would hang out at this horse stable, and I would, you know, just because they were fun to be around. A friend of mine had a couple of ponies, but um, I'd be hanging out there anyway. And then somebody started paying me to do stuff that I was inclined to do anyway. Oh, you want to groom my horse for me? Here, here's five bucks. Thanks. Here's another five if you clean the stall. And this was in the '60s, so that was good money. And, uh, you know, getting paid to play. That's how I saw it. You know, we I, were like digging... I like being paid to play better than playing to pay or pay to play. Yeah. And I'm talking nine years old. Yeah. So, you know, at the same age I had. Well, of course, he's going to pay you extra because he doesn't want you to fucking blow up his place. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So this kid, um, hey, give him a couple extra bucks. He, he's got that new cannon thing he's been working on. I don't like it. Let's get on his good side. Well, I don't know. I, I just think it's very uh, a gratifying thing to be able to fix your own stuff, make your own things, and to do it well. Uh, fixing your own appliances. Wow. Since YouTube, geez, I swear to God, you can do anything. Um, I fixed major appliances, <laughs> all kinds of stuff I'd never done before. And, uh, when you're watching somebody do it and you can pause and you know yeah. you got some paper well, you're, you're there's no reason to be stuck it blows the uh encyclopedia britannica out of the water oh yeah i mean there's uh there's good cheat charts out there too that have always been around but Watching somebody uh, do a particular thing on a vid is a real lifesaver, especially on vehicles. You know, you got a particular year and model of something. Yeah, I just did that with my Explorer. Very specific stuff, and it's got its own specific challenges. Well, I like the, the guys that make these videos. I've seen a few of them because we I had to do some different things. And these guys are just uh, doing God's work. They're like, oh, okay, I know somebody out there needs to do this. Okay, it's this car, it's this year, it's this part, it's bullshit. You know, you have to get under here and move this. Look at the time at the bottom. And if it's under two minutes, I'll watch that one first. <laughs> yeah, then you have the clip notes. I don't want to, you know, meet the dog, listen to the dog. <laughs> you give me, I want this thing over. Come on, let's go.
No, just get straight directly to it immediately. Yeah, that's a that's the that's that's amazing because it, I mean, look how many people save so much money and actually, I don't know. There's some things that you got to do because they've got the tools, and so basically that's what you're paying for and the knowledge. Of course, don't talk smack about mechanics because they fucking do great work. But uh, it's like uh, the way cars are built now. You just need a screwdriver and a and a wrench. <laughs> yeah. Um. So you're pre hole. You're pre uh, making those holes for the screws that are going to go in there. What screws are you using? Are you using the basic? Or are you going crazy like sassy with it? These bad boys right here. Show us number one. ten. Number ten. It's got to have a quarter inch is even better but we don't need that much uh using tight bond three and it's not going anywhere it's you didn't show us i didn't see the screw where's that oh i thought i did I thought, no i didn't see it so these are, are is that a black is that a silver no this is uh here's the brand and it's got little cutters underneath the, the pan head so it countersinks itself Okay, that's why that's the motivation yeah. behind getting that one. Right? No, it's it's good hardware. Yeah, I want to, I just want to see what good hardware looks like. Well, this is the shit here. Um, and will you do a uh, what kind of varnish are you gonna do that with? Or will you do a uh, like a high gloss with that, or at the end, or will you just leave it natural? No, I'll probably just do uh like a Danish oil. It's basically a. a Tongue oil with a solvent, and uh, and do you buff that out or do you just wipe it out? Oh, uh, you, you you can do both, but I'll do uh like a two twenty finish on this, and then uh, there's a couple ways to go. I like oil. Um, you can make a mess out of the oil if you don't know what you're doing. There's a lot of products out there, but uh, good old fashioned uh, penetrating oil. And just done frequently. You need to do it every few months because it, it'll oh, dry. Oh, you gotta out. keep it up like a like a steel pan. Oh yeah, yeah. You can't idle on it. It's it's like owning a yacht. And um, so, what happens when somebody puts a a, a glass on there with uh, some condensation? Well, it'll it'll get marks and rings and character and stuff. And you know, you can just buff it out with a Scotch Brite and then re-oil it. And if it get starts to get gummy, you use a little acetone and a red Scotch Brite. That's a slightly more abrasive one. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to sand it. You don't want to break through because you've got a patina. You've got layers of these oils that are polymerized really well. And so um, you yeah, want to look. Like, it seems like if you have to buff something out, that would leave it blotchy because you'd be starting from scratch again on that spot. Yeah. Yeah. You can burn through and fuck it up pretty quick. But there's products out there like uh, Penafin makes this architectural grade, which is a film forming coating. It's not a penetrating oil. It builds a layer up and there's advantages and disadvantages for that. It doesn't last two years. No, I, I see that you're using a DeWalt there. Is that a DeWalt that you're using? Yep. Are you a DeWalt guy or a king? Is that the, why is DeWalt the best? I like them. I've had them a long time. Yeah, they had a, a special deal with McLaren, and they made these really cool, sort of a charcoal gray uh, color scheme. It was a whole kit with a saw and drills and the whole bit. I don't know if that's still out there, but it was a, a limited edition 20-volt uh, pack. <laughs> So you are you gonna do the you're gonna do those legs for that table and steel? I you I'd imagine. No, I'll show you. wait. What did you it. show me the? Are you doing? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, I was gonna show you my leg. The legs? Yes, oh, yes. Oh shit! Got oil all over the table. Well, good thing I'm doing an oil finish. This will come out with a salt. Oh, that's the leg of the table. Yeah, and this oh, is one. Of the piece of lumber yeah that, damn. things gonna be heavy and how yeah. will you bolt that in will you go through the top to bolt that in or no have a, a clasp the that whole thing 
way too heavy. So what I'm making are sockets and uh, it's going to be a 3 16th steel plate. I'm going to make basically a socket that the leg drops in and there's through bolts that'll go through that. And uh, I'll tap threads on one side of the metal socket. So uh, the legs will be removable and the steel sockets that they go in, it won't, it can't deflect. It can't wobble or bend or snap off. It's a very solid connection. With a table as heavy as this, if it started racking or if somebody was trying to drag it, just the weight of it, and it, it could put a lot of pressure on a, a corner of the table and just snap it all out. Because the skirt... Um, well, I don't think it, you, when you build something like that, I don't imagine that they'd want to move it around a lot. No, no. And then uh, usually I do a trestle underneath because you, you usually want to have a lateral stabilizing component but what i'm going to do is the steel works that are going to go it'll be hidden behind the skirt this is one of the edge ends and then the, the skirt will continue it's it's got a half inch reveal but on the interior side of it you've got all this room here like two and three quarter inches so it'll have plenty of room to have lots of contact with several small screws and some urethane adhesive, I'm going to mount the steel on the inside of this. So it's never going to come apart. It's a like forever, uh, that connection. But uh, because once you set lumber outdoors, the sun uh, and the weather will really challenge it. It's uh, little, it'll age it, and but everything the steel will age, you know, it's like a, it's like a living thing, it's like your koi pond. Yeah. Take care of it. You don't want it to ever sag or have any uh, any wear issues, and this certainly won't. Can you protect but, it? Like, uh, I mean, aging, like uh, over here in Oregon, they uh, the it, it's nice to have it. Like, you know, you beat up a little bit, but like, um, like what happens? Like, when can you Scotch guard that at all, or do you just it's just the 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 stain, and it's just good. You just got to do it like that, like a pan. There's no reinforcing the strength of the getting shit fucked up on it not really i've tried a bunch of different techniques i tried one where you, you use a really uh, uh light viscosity epoxy you thin it out and you use a real slow cure catalyst on it and the idea is you want to let it absorb into the wood and plasticize it you remember the body worlds exhibit yeah it changed the my life plastic well, it's called stabilizing, but there's a way to, if, if you put the lumber in a vacuum and apply heat with this slow cure epoxy, uh, you plasticize, you stabilize the wood. And uh, it's, it's a thing that's done. A friend of mine's a knife maker and he stabilizes all the wood scales. He'll get like bog oak that's a thousand years old and, uh, you know, mastodon tusks and things. And so what they do is they stabilize them in this manner so they don't degrade. Oh. But uh, there's other ways of stabilizing the wood where they basically cook it and they impregnate it with a silica and steam it in there. And it's a whole process. This is a that. PG show. You can't be talking about stuff like that. Yeah, they do that with yellow pine and a couple other wood species. And you effectively have a wood that bugs will never eat. It can't rot, mold won't grow on it. Hey, Bill, you kind of touched on a subject that I want to talk to you about because it is a perfect, perfect opportunity. Yeah. Um, you're talking about the mastodon. How soon do you think it'll be before they bring back the uh, woolly mammoth? Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh, I don't know. That'd be fun. If they have miniature ones, I want one. I'll take it to the dog park. <laughs> Name them Larry. I want, I want a woolly mammoth. So, but like, even if they were bring back, they were talking about the, uh, you know, the Tasmanian uh, tiger thing, or you know, the the one that is extinct that they found. You know, it looks like a dog with as a marsupial. What's it called? I've been, I've talked about a nauseum on this place thing, but um, right. you're on the that thing. They're get, they can bring that back. They can bring back a dinosaur. Do you think that? Or what happens? You know what? If they do bring it back a dinosaur. Do they, uh, what do they just show everybody, uh, the cow running out in the middle of the field and the T Rex fucking eating it and fucking disgusting it was blood splatter? Uh, you gotta feed it something if they bring them back. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, 
way to go on. I, I really hope we don't have these uh, very, uh, if it goes back to Caligula, which it kind of seems <laughs> like a whole bit what everybody wants to do with the youngins and stuff. And it's it's like some disturbing stuff. Um, I don't know. I could see all kinds of heinous, wicked things done with uh, trying to create new hybrids and stuff. And, you know, um, ah, can of worms. I don't know. Um, can of worms, baby. Can of worms. Okay, It'll, so what do you think about those guys bringing back that worm that was in our Antarctica that was uh, defrost after like 50 billion years? I don't know. I hope we didn't piss it off. <laughs> Somebody put yeah. like a, somebody put like it looks yummy. I want one. <laughs> yeah. Jeez, I don't know. Well, humans are pretty resilient, though. I, I have faith that somehow we're going to survive because they've been trying to kill us straight up our whole lives, dude. I swear to God, if you read ingredients on basic shit, you'll find out that industries were like, oh, gee, we can't just go around unconscionably dumping all these waste products from all. Oh, of our dude, different back in before the twenty first that- century, the industrial age. Those guys were dumping that shit right into the fucking water. All well, guess, those, all guess what? Shit. This will make you real happy. You know what they did? They're still doing it? <laughs> no, they don't put it in the water anymore. They bury it? They feed it back to us. I'm not joking. There's a lot of industrial My, trash. Well, the explosion will happen. Of- Read the ingredients on a lot of products that you put on your skin and your hair and wash your clothes with. Just well, read it. I don't it. wash my hair. I don't wash my clothes. And I don't put anything on my skin. So I'm okay, right? No, I'm still not all right. <laughs> no, it's it's they uh, put it back in the food chain and into products. So fluoride's an example. You, you can't just indiscriminately dump that stuff. So they, oh, let's just put it in the water. They'll ingest it and we'll disperse it that way. We're not polluting a particular spot on the earth with our stuff. Let's just distribute it back among our... Um, so it'll be consumed, they ship back out, and then... Kind of, yeah, they feed it back to us. Um, Isn't that uh, funny, though? Do you ever think about this, like how the planet keeps on eating itself? Like, since the time that we're born, like, everything is uh, uh, eating uh, itself. Like, things yeah. eat. Well, that's what nature does, is it eats. Yeah, we're we're cannibalizing ourselves constantly. I mean, look at any kind of corporate model as an example. Um, you know, the thing of, um, you know, get some hotshot CFO, and you know, we we gotta earn, we gotta make earnings for our shareholders. That's what we have to do, and it's good to make bonuses. So what ends up happening is you have a really good company with a really good product, and they're running as efficiently as they possibly can. They're doing so good. And then somebody goes to retire, you got a new CFO come in, but somebody that's highly motivated to really kill it. They don't want to wait decades for a big payoff. They want it like that quarter. So well, look gonna... at Disney. Look at Disney. Disney is a great example of that. Yeah. Well, what happens is you got to squeeze it out of somewhere. If you can't squeeze it out of your labor, something's got to go. We got to cannibalize something in this system so that I get my bonus and we get earnings for shareholders if that means that we make a shittier product and it hurts us in a couple of years i don't care i got paid i'm out of here see ya we did great that year and then i left before the shit hit the fan that's how a lot of cfos do and it's an unsustainable model and damn if you just you know look up the chain of command and see how long that's been going on Nobody's really thinking of two generations of <laughs> No, it's hey, been going on I since the fucking first Neanderthal fucking met the first Cro Magnum. It's like uh, it's been gone. Isn't it essentially all about territory, though? Don't you find like the thing that the politics of it is that it's a ri- about the original watering hole. The 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 water was there. Two tribes, just to simplify it, needed the water. One was already there, then ensue a a fight for the water, then a commingling of the water, and then so on and so forth. Yeah. Territory. Sure. Well, that's some of the basics of it, but... But that's a root. Uh, that's the root. 
Yeah. He who does not have the water does not have the life. You need the water, the water source, whatever. It could be an allegory. It could be gold. It could be coal. Yeah. Um. Gosh, I don't know. Basic economics and all that. I don't know either. Yeah, I, 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 just, still, I think I it's like, a visual story, though. That that seems to unravel a lot. Like, even, like, neighbors that don't talk to each other, like, everyone's territorial about their spaces. Oh, and, yeah. Well, that's an imperative that every person has. I mean, it's like, don't touch my shit. Don't encroach. I mean, it's pretty basic. I don't know. I like to think of myself as uh, kind of a hunter gatherer is my overall approach to things and uh you know i try to tread lightly and uh you know take a piece but not too much like they say in that all right uh what are we doing so wait, uh, real quick do you think they'll bring like the woolly mammoth we never talked about it oh uh, i don't know I, I gotta ponder that one do you want to you wanna see it you just uh no nah, i i gotta bounce i gotta oh, yeah, bounce all right Hey, uh, well, thanks, uh, Daryl Cobb. Is there any last words of wisdom that you can give to the world uh, uh, out there to make their day a better day? Yeah, I don't know. Just think kind, loving thoughts if you possibly can and have a sense of humor. Good Lord, you know, it makes it all a lot easier. As long as it's not at the expense of someone else, if you can laugh about this stuff somehow, it makes it way more tolerable. Levity, the best. Levity. What's the what's the funniest movie you've ever seen? Raising Arizona. It's classic. Love it. Um, it all that, you. that world is is amazing, and everybody knows the spot where it had gained altitude and then it plateaued, and it's like, damn, that energy was so good, and then it plateaued, and then it picks back up again, and then it ends great. But there's a part in uh, it's a mad, 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 mad world where it, it kind of goes like, hmm, it's a good bathroom break time in the film because you know every. I love yeah. every second of it's a mad, mad, mad world. It's been my. I it's like I, my, I that is the movie I built my whole love of movies on that and Young Frankenstein, but that the seeing a young Jonathan Winters, and you got fucking uh that guy who was uh Bill Silvers. Well, everybody. I mean, everybody is in that movie. I mean, they got even the fucking Three Stooges for a cameo, real quick. Yeah, yeah. And that except movie go to spawn Joe. other. What's that? Except it was with Joe. I wish it was Curly, but Curly been gone for a while. Yeah, he that. took off early. Unfortunately, he's the funniest one. I love Curly, but um, it's a mad, 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 mad world. Is like the. I mean. It's like the, I don't know, you got such a variety of constantly ham, hamming, like everybody eats up the fucking scenery. Yeah. Well, that, that movie, we went and saw it at a theater in, in Downey, and I remember it vividly, and I think it was 66 when that came out, but I would have been six, or I would have been five, so. Yeah, what? I, the first movie I ever saw in movie theater was Harold and Maude. Oh, wow. That's a good one. That's a... Uh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. that's... Like, such, just, like, you can't you can't do that twice. It's, you know, it's it's, it's like feeling, that. It's a vibe. It's, a, it's, it's like a capturing a mosquito in amber. It's a moment that's captured. Yeah. Uh, it's a moment. Well, who's who is this? Carlos Santana was saying... Um, Oh, who was he watching play? But he he talked about well he he refers to it as Put the whole. Put your frame in, your head in the frame for a second. There you go. There you go. Yeah, Carlos Santana. He he talks about uh, who was he talking about? He was talking about Ginger Baker and some other guys that he was watching play. But he said there's a certain moment when in live music that where the Holy Spirit shows up, and there's an energy you can't describe it, and everybody in the space feels it. And it's it's just there, and you you can't describe it, and it's just what that. It magic. looks like a fish show or a Grateful Dead thing. I went to a fish show at the at the Hollywood Bowl when I was over there, on mushrooms, and uh -huh. and that was a you know one of those special moments where you feel like one with everybody. 
Oh, oh for sure. Until you get out of the, the parking lot. Then everybody changes. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, it, it gets not so not so groovy. <laughs> I remember yeah. but that's how, that's human nature though too because like I remember taking this trip with a bunch of people to the Amazon and Colombia and Brazil and and all this stuff that happened. I documented. I'm still editing that footage, but it's like um, and when be, everybody we began we didn't know, no not a lot of us knew each other. There was friends that knew each other. That's why they were there. But like as we all kind of, kind of, kind of acclimated to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, to be descriptive and short about it, uh, when we were getting back to reality after like three weeks of travel and all these experiences, and some people had to leave the playing the the tour early and stuff like that, and I was documenting the whole thing, but like um, I remember watching everybody change on the airport back into their other selves while they're getting in line to get on the onto the airplane like their ch their mannerisms changed their clothes changed their eyeglasses came on it's like their 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 other self was uh was um going back to that reality yeah so what was that movie where kevin spacey's playing this gimpy character and he's uh <laughs> what the hell is that movie uh the usual suspects that's it. Yeah, where he's walking down the street and he just transforms, kind of like that. People are a trip. Isn't that funny how humans can do that? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, especially since some of them are reptilian as well. So you know that <laughs> was not. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, word. Your neurons are part in play there, but uh, it's funny because I. Uh, my wife has said that uh, my whole uh, persona changes when I speak Spanish. Yeah. And my body is very different and just all these inflections are totally like, whoa, who the hell was that? Like you just became a different person there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, it's uh, my, my Mexican archetype kicks in or something. But Yeah. Um, well, well, you're like an empathic person. You probably take on the um... – yeah, almost well, to your, to your uh, detriment. Like uh, take on the personalities of people that you're around. Yeah, yeah. Would not like in a. I found myself doing that too. Like at an early age, is like, well, but I also like, I worked at a restaurant, so I was learning, you know, restaurant Spanish. So I was just throwing out words that were like really nasty all the time. <laughs> I didn't know. I just thought they sounded fun, <laughs> and the cooks would all get pissed <laughs> off at me. The all pinch yeah. and yeah. You know. Uh, right. you know, <laughs> like, and then I would say back to them, and then you know the whole. It's a, it's a great Mexican Spanish is a fucking beautiful language. Oh yeah, yeah, it's uh right handy to to be able to speak it too. It's, if you got Spanish down, you get French, Italian, it all's just really simple. It's they're all it's the same stuff. Do you think that uh, Mexico should be uh, have had the other half of uh, California? I don't know what you mean. Like, uh, like the borderline. If, if if this were still Mexico, yeah. Um, it pretty much yeah. is. If you go to San Diego, basically ten miles over, it's Mexico. That San Diego is basically Mexico. Yeah. Well, I mean, L.A. Shit. I mean, uh, there were kids in my kindergarten class that spoke no English. I learned more Spanish in my algebra class than I did algebra. So, that's if Spanish was very easy for me. Um, but yeah that was uh i don't know it's, it's uh i love the culture oh man christmas go do tamale raids you know there's always somebody's mama that made better tamales and oh shit there's a place in bakersfield that's a mexican market over there that um that has like just rows of like fucking hot tamales in you know like a containment that's a heated containment that you just can, you know, go in and pick and mix and, ma mix and match. They got like cool. maybe 24 in a row. Oh, like, wow. Double sided. Like, like you got pineapple, uh, you got chicken, pineapple, and you got beef, pork. You got this crazy assortment. It's authentic too. It's like super, like right there. It was just made like an hour ago. Wow. Shit's good. Yeah. That's the real deal. <laughs> 
I like authentic Mexican food. Well, I love Mexico. I haven't been in a while. Um, TJ is got kind of, had kind of a revival happening like just before COVID and all that. And I'm sure it's back, but there's some really nice restaurants in TJ. And there's a pretty vibrant art scene down there as well. I haven't checked into it lately, but it's always good to go with somebody that is familiar. But yeah, um, yeah you don't want to go to Mexico with. Uh, <laughs> I don't. Know, I mean, I I have a. I would go maybe to Mexico, but I'd have to definitely not. I would like to. You got to go with a group of people. Well, you, know, you, know, you yeah, can't just um, go by yourself or your a girlfriend or something or whatever. I went to Costa Rica by myself. Had no trouble. Um, but you're little... young and stupid back then, so. Like, so we... <laughs> um, yeah, you find that... I, we got pulled over once. God, this is previous lifetime, probably almost thirty years ago. But got pulled over coming home from an AA meeting at the Presidente Hotel, and dude with a machine gun wearing a wife beater. Uh, is gesturing to pull off the road. He had and a machine there, gun. Yeah, well, there were some regular cops. There were there were federales, but one of them's wearing a white beater, and another guy's drinking a beer. Nice. And wanting us to pull off of the main road. And uh, it was, a, I don't know, probably six of us minivan. And uh, what time so of we, day was what time of day was it? It was probably ten, eleven o'clock at night. Yeah, from Cabo back to San Jose del Cabo. Ooh, that's dangerous, baby. And uh, and yeah, this was before they fixed the road. This was in the. Uh, they don't fix the roads there. They make you do that on purpose, where they got to get brake jobs. No, uh, this was they did. Imp- they put a proper road in back in the eighties. The highway f- from the airport to Cabo was really sketch. Um, but then that was during this era. But yeah, they pull us all over and. I was driving here and uh, I just started talking to the guys and I told them, well, we live on Paseo Finisterra and our neighbor across the street is so-and-so who is the mayor of San Jose del Cabo. And then uh, I mentioned a couple of uh, contractors that I'd met because my ex-wife's family was building stuff down there. And I just made it clear that I was, wasn't a local, but you know, I wasn't, naive and you know i knew people and they were pleasant they didn't try to ask for money or anything they said okay have a good evening Just go ahead and we went on did they give you a reason for pulling you over nope yeah that's the problem too. they don't need police, to policing in certain parts of the world is entrepreneurial if you will yeah <laughs> Uh, you got we through a trip. Yeah. We did a, a, a surf trip uh, uh, past this, uh, around the city of Cortez or something like that. But uh, uh, the mayor, we met, we parked this RV for my buddy's uh, birthday, where he'd later meet his wife at that party. Uh, we parked this huge, like, you know, hundred and fifty thousand dollar vehicle on the beach, and they all surfed all day. And after like the sixth day, you know, the gazebo, you know, the whole everyone's everyone's. Uh, everyone's uh it's called the beach of ranch um uh, uh but like everyone's like housing was on the cliff it was a gorgeous thing but the fifth or sixth day the mayor came out with his kids and his wife so uh, we see you've uh, been enjoying our beaches and our lifestyle <laughs> wow and uh so basically he shut he shook him down for some money oh i see wow well, I haven't been on a proper traveling vacay in quite some time. I have no idea where I'd want to go. I just hope the world doesn't catch on fire, blow up, or sink. Or oh, you know it will. You know it's going to blow up and just get on fire. It's going to be crazy. Well, we should. Wep- re- re- we'll get back to the 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 weather that you're about to hit right now. So you're not feeling any difference in the temperature right now. It's not hitting. You might be lucky. You might be spared over there. I think it's gonna hit the lower coastlines. Yeah, more than likely. I. It looks like the same day it was earlier. Nothing different. Nothing new. No novel phenomenon or anything. But I haven't turned on the news yet, so. 
Anyway, I am going to make me an espresso and chase my dogs with the hose and water some plants right now since the storm's coming, but the plants are dehydrated right now, so. Well, all right. Well, thanks for being on the show. We finally got you to see. Now I never have to ask you to be on the show ever again. Yeah, that was spontaneous and easy. If it were something where I had to think about it and plan for it and get ready for it, I'd be reluctant. But if you catch me in the mom, it's like, yeah, sure. Why not? I'm, yeah, I'm in the middle of about three different things, but yeah, I can do that too. Why not? Well, but I love to see the wood that you're working on because it's really nice. So it's good to talk about it because that's what you do as you work with the material. Well, I'll send you a flurry of pics and maybe a vid as uh, progress. And then uh, maybe if you could attach that to your episode, I don't know how that works. I'm going to have this episode out tonight or by tomorrow morning. So if you want to okay. show me, if you want pictures, you know. Uh, it won't be quite ready by then, but. Um... I don't know. Yeah, I, like, uh, I don't like to sit on these episodes too too much, but maybe I'll I'll put, I can always put them in future episodes as well. Sure, because you're not. Gonna, it's gonna take you a week to finish that table. Yeah, yeah. I was hoping to have it done again. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. Well, these got to. I'll 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 make it like a. I'll do like a maybe a put a little scene of the finished product in a different video. I like to have That's these now. They're spontaneous. Right on. That'll work. If I it would kill me to sit on this video for a week. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, do whatever. We could always add some. Yeah, later. This is the beginning. But um, what's your favorite tea? What tea are you making? Uh, it's, uh, let's see. Uh, Cafe Bustello, the yellow can. That stuff. That's oh, the espresso that I get. I, I don't buy no $20 a pound fancy boutique Poppy beans, I get like, oh, that one's three bucks for a pound. That okay, that works. It's got the same caffeine as the expensive stuff. All right, I'll do it. I can dig it. I can dig it. Coffee's got. I mean, uh, yeah. It seems I like, like just oh, my yeah. there's a neat little English creamer set or something. I just like these weird little creepy faces. Was uh, where? What the hell's the story with that thing? uh it, it they were my grandmother's i guess it's an english thing these little tiny cups with faces on it um i got one that's winking at you and a couple of others i don't know some of them are broken it makes a fine little uh espresso shot isn't that cute that's my little espresso head dude oh he's a big baby he's a big baby <laughs> Cheers. All right, Brett. I got All right, Daryl. Great to talk to you. Great to uh, hang up. Be safe on the storm. Uh, be well. Uh, tell uh, your wife uh, I say hi, and tell Malibu and the whole West Coast to uh, survive and be well. And hey, this is fun. This is great. Awesome. Love you, Brett. Love you too, man. Be well. Soon, man. Soon. Yeah. Cheers. 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 Okay, so that was my first podcast. I've been back in Oregon. Got my teeth worked on. Clean, filled. I feel good. I hope you feel good too. Um, uh, let's see. LA was a trip. That was a lot of things happening in a short amount of time. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the Moksha episode. Um, I was extremely nervous. I probably drank a little bit more than I should have. And it was the most editing I've ever done on one of these shows. But I think the, the finished product speaks for itself. I think it's a great show. I think I love Moksha. This is a fantastic, uh, to get her to interview me was quite an honor. So thank you, Moksha. And, um, I don't know if I'll ever be interviewed on my own show again because I was so fucked up. I was so nervous. You wouldn't believe how, and plus I was moving, I was trying to figure out the LA thing. And I should have been gone out of LA three weeks prior to leaving that spot. But um, anyways, things happen for the way they happen. Had to drive up, spent some time in Santa Barbara, went and visited a friend, in San Jose, then be be lined it back up to Oregon. So we're back in the garage. The weather's gonna be good here for a while. 
new beginnings. Thanks for watching. Subscribe. Check out my website, brotwoods.com, Brotwoods22 on Instagram. I know. This is a theater of one. I uh, hope you guys, um, well, be safe out there. Ciao, ciao. No. Um, see you later. One, two. Friend, 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 friend is never going to end. to people about stuff he's the podcast man